Hello, everyone. It looks like the number of people entering has started to slow down, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Policy Lab Policy for Shared Prosperity event series, Basic Income Programs, Successes, Challenges, and Policy Solutions. We have a wonderful set of speakers for you today. Nicole Russo from Ideas42 is going to be moderating. Lisa Gilbert, Director of the Center for Economic Support at the City of Alexandria Department of Community and Services will be one of our panelists, as well as Lori Finkst, the Senior Director at the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, and Sarah Stripp, the Managing Director of Springboard to Opportunities. Before I turn it over to them, I just want to give you a quick introduction to the Ideas 42 Policy Lab. So at the Policy Lab, we apply insights from behavioral science to advance public policies that promote equity and well-being for everyone, but with a focus on those policies that are most important for people experiencing poverty and Black, Brown, and Indigenous people, people with disabilities, and people from communities who have faced historic discrimination. So we are working towards a more just and equitable world, one where people have the resources they need, not just economic, but also the political and social capital to lead lives with dignity and autonomy. With the Policy for Shared Prosperity event series, we bring together behavioral scientists, researchers, and practitioners together to discuss the pressing policy issues of the day and how behavioral science can make us help us make better policy decisions. I think um, today's panel is gonna be a great example of that. And so I will now turn the mic over to Nicole. Thank you so much, Kelly. It is a pleasure to be here today with our incredible panel of speakers. And so that we can get to their presentations as quickly as possible, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about what behavioral science has to say, about guaranteed income and the work we've been doing here at Ideas42. So behavioral science is the study of human behavior and it draws from the fields of economics and psychology which have traditionally each held opposing views about human behavior. So where economists think about our preferences as stable, our beliefs as accurate and our behavior an expression of those, psychologists argue that our preferences can shift, our beliefs can be biased and our behavior is an expression of those two things plus a lot of other things like our emotions and our social context. And when we combined insights from these two fields about 40 years ago, we got behavioral science, which told us that our behavior is actually quite predictable and it's much more a product of our context or our environment and situation than of our personal or our innate characteristics. Put another way, even the best trained pilot when put in a poorly designed cockpit is gonna crash a plane because context matters. This is actually a true story about World War II fighter pilots who were inexplicably crashing planes despite being some of the best pilots in the country. The Air Force brought in a psychologist who figured out that actually changing a single switch in the cockpit immediately stopped all these crashes and saved lives. And I tell this story because I want to pose the question of, if we think about poverty as a cockpit, what can we learn about how to change that context so that people can safely land that plane and escape poverty long term? Behavioral science actually gives us the key to doing this, which is the knowledge that our cognitive bandwidth is limited. In other words, our mental resources at any given time are finite. So these are things like our ability to pay attention, our working memory, <clears throat> our cognitive control, even our ability to resist temptation. And this limitation is exacerbated when our resources like food, time, and money are scarce. And scarcity causes us to do something called tunneling, which is to fixate on whatever it is that we lack. Now, this can be adaptive and actually helpful in the short term. So I want you to think back to the last time that you had to cram for a deadline. In the weeks leading up to that, you probably didn't think much about it, but I bet the night before you had a laser focus. And in some ways, scarcity and that resulting tunnel was really helpful to you in meeting that deadline. However, if you are constantly in a state of tunneling, it is not only unhelpful, it is dangerous. And there's an entire book about this if you'd like to learn more about the science behind scarcity. But let's talk more about how tunneling works. So here are some things we all have to do, right? We all have to pay rent, make dinner, pay our bills, hit work deadlines. But now imagine that you're on your way home and you get into a car accident. Suddenly you can't think about anything else. Are you gonna think about what you're gonna make for dinner or what deadline you have tomorrow? No, you're going to be thinking about whether or not you and the passengers in that car are okay, getting that car fixed, how much getting it fixed is going to cost, 
you are in the tunnel. And as I mentioned, this tunneling can be adaptive. Of course, you're zeroed on the car. It's a key component of keeping up with the rest of your life. You probably needed to get to work and get paid. But if you're going from car accident to childcare issue, to paying a bill, to an unexpected healthcare cost without any slack to recover, it is not trivial. Behavioral science research shows that a single, even a brief instance of scarcity can have cognitive costs or a bandwidth tax that's been quantified by researchers as mentally equivalent to going 24 hours without sleep. So when you're facing these issues day in and day out without a break as a result of chronic scarcity, as so many people living in poverty do, the effects of being this tunnel matter a lot. And the beauty of guaranteed income is that not only does it give people more cognitive bandwidth by giving them a primary resource that they lack, which is cash, it also gives people an often overlooked but equally important resource, which is time. Because that cash comes with no strings attached. Guaranteed income is groundbreaking from a behavioral perspective because it did not demand the time that many other benefits programs do of people living in poverty who are already so severely time constrained. And when we have more bandwidth, we're better able to do things like manage and maintain our money, our food, and our time, which gives us in turn more bandwidth. So putting cash in the hands of people who are experiencing chronic scarcity gives them the resources they need to get out of that tunnel and to focus on other important things like spending time with their kids or making that month's rent, maybe even getting a better job or giving back to their community, which is actually something we see a lot in guaranteed income programs. In short, guaranteed income helps us design a better cockpit that gives people a fighting chance to land that plane and escape poverty for good. So I'll just close by saying a few quick words about what we're doing in guaranteed income here at Ideas 42. So the first is working with nonprofits, cities and states to behaviorally inform the design and the evaluation of their programs, which means breaking down behavioral barriers to things like participation, access, equitable implementation and measurement. And the second is applying behavioral insights to shift harmful narratives about people living in poverty and unconditional cash to help us unlock political will and support for a guaranteed income at scale. And this in many ways is the next frontier of guaranteed income, which you'll hear more about today. I wanna to turn it over now to Sarah Strip, who is the Managing Director at Springboard to Opportunities and one of our partners in Narrative Change for Guaranteed Income. Sarah's gonna talk about the work Springboard's been doing in the guaranteed income realm from the perspective of a nonprofit. Awesome, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit more about our program, the Magnolia Mothers Trust, uh, which is one of the kind of first guaranteed income pilots that was started um, in this newer wave of talking about guaranteed income that we've had. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Amanda, perfect. Uh, so Springboard to Opportunities is a nonprofit in Jackson, Mississippi. We work with families who live in federally subsidized housing and provide programs and services to help them reach their goals. Um, everything we do comes from what we call our radically resident driven model, um, which means that all of our programs um, are really designed and, and made in partnership with our residents themselves. So we, we spend time in focus groups and doing surveys and having conversations to say, what is it that you need um, in order to break out of cycles of poverty and be able to reach your goals as opposed to us coming in and telling you what you need because we think families are the best experts on their own lives. Um, so while we started as an organization in 2013, um, doing, you know, lots of programs, kind of the things that you would think an app or a nonprofit would do, like after school programs, workforce development, um, building community, different things like that. Um, as we continue to have these conversations with, with families about what it might look like to really move the needle on poverty, what they kept telling us over and over again was that they didn't need another program. What they needed was cash. Um, you know, you can't get to work if you don't have gas to put in your car. Um, you can't afford childcare if your childcare voucher doesn't kick in until, you know, a month after um, having worked for 40 hours each week, or if you can't buy diapers to provide for the childcare center. Um, you know, all these kind of really basic needs uh, that there aren't social safety net supports for um, and that you really need to have cash in order to be able to start working towards your goals. Um, so we, out of that, in partnership with our families, created the Magnolia Mothers Trust, um, which is really trying to reimagine what support for low-income families can look like. Um, so this program started in 2018, uh, was when our first cohort was, and we are currently in the midst of our fourth cohort of families. Um, 
And what we really want to show through this is just how much uh, we think that the that our systems need to be based in trusting families, first of all, and knowing that they are the ones who um, have the resources and know what they need to be the authors of their own lives. So the Magnolia Mothers Trust um, currently supports up to 100 moms per cohort. Uh, we give them $1,000 of no strings attached monthly cash, as well as a seated um, children's savings account as a 529 for each child participant. So we put $1,000 in that um, 529 account for each child of a mother who's a part of the program. Um, our program lasts for 12 months. Uh, and while they're doing that, not only are they getting the cash, but they also are connected to our staff, including um, a community coach who is there to help them as they're reaching their goals and, and kind of like thinking through resources and what they want to look like, um, as well as connecting with each other and really building kind of like their own community uh, amongst the mothers who are a part of that. Um, which I think is oftentimes one of the strongest ways of, of just kind of like building connections and being able to be connected. Um, because again, I think our, our families know better than anyone else, like what the resources are and what they need and, and how to support and help each other as they continue to grow. Uh, so as I said, we've been doing this program since 2018, which really makes us one of the longest running programs um, that has happened in the country. Uh, and so we also have a lot of data, um, which is really exciting to get to see. And, and even though our program is, is small and in one particular place, I think um, it's really exciting to kind of see what we have shown as, and particularly how it relates to some of the things Nicole was talking about with behavioral science and, and, and really, helping moms be able to move past some of those scarcity mindsets and have that breathing room um, in order to really think about their goals and, and think about what is next for them. Um, so while our first couple cohorts, we did more quantitative studies and, and I can quote to you some numbers and things if you want at the end, if that's a question folks have. Um, but with this last cohort that finished up um, in 2021, or no, I'm sorry, 2022, um, earlier this year, we were able to really do a qualitative study to look a little bit more um, at some of like what is actually happening internally, what is ha helping these changes happen, um, what is allowing moms to be able to make these choices in new ways. Uh, so particularly what we saw in this cohort um, was that in contrast to a lot of the trends um, that showed the negative effects of unpredictability, particularly with COVID, right? So lots of families um, losing jobs, um, continuing to lose jobs as they'd have to like take off time for uh, children's childcare or with essential jobs that didn't have a lot of COVID leave and things like that. Um, we saw that the Magnolia Mothers Trust really provided that baseline of stability and support um, that was able to help moms feel safe and cared for, um, particularly in an increasingly unpredictable world. Um, so throughout the duration of this program, we also saw mothers really report enhanced self of self-efficacy and agency, um, which was allowing them to make their own decisions around work and really prioritizing the care of their children and families. If we want to go to the next slide, I'll kind of dig into each of those a little bit more. Um, so by the end of the program, uh, pretty much all 97.6% of mothers reported feeling extremely supported um, by the Magnolia Mothers Trust to be able to meet their family's needs. 79% uh, reporting feeling more hopeful about their future. 82% feeling more hopeful about their children's future and 70% felt more capable of caring for their own emotional, physical, and mental health needs, um, which I think really kind of speaks to the ability of programs like this to help moms get out of, of sort of some of that tunneling um, and being really focused um, in sort of that scarcity mindset, but to be able to, to feel, again, like they have that baseline of support that allows them to kind of move beyond that and think about um, some of the bigger goals and, and things that they are working toward. Um, so these are kind of the three big areas that we really saw a lot of the moms talk about in this report as well. Um, the first one is around that self-efficacy and agency um, and really that enhanced sense that both of those things showed up with our reports. Um, this is really exciting to us, particularly because these are, are important tools that the moms can continue to use after the program as they work through their goals. Um, so 
the program, as I've said before, is designed in partnership with our moms. So they were really the ones who picked um, how long the program would be and how much money they would get each month and um, kind of worked with us to make that happen. Um, so even though the program is, is shorter at 12 months, um, something like enhanced health of self-efficacy and agency are things that carry on beyond just the 12 months of the program. Um, so we're excited to see the ways that that can continue to help moms continue to reach their goals, um, even if they're not receiving the cash anymore. Um, and also just kind of the increased sense of self-confidence that most of the moms are feeling by the end of the program. Um, what we heard again and again was folks being able to move from simply reacting to situations. So, right, not having to just react to something like the car accident example that Nicole gave, um, to feeling like they really had the ability to drive the circumstances around them and make those decisions for themselves and for their own lives. Um, another huge area that we saw um, growth in was, was thinking about work. Um, so I think a lot of the, the arguments that are levied against guaranteed income are that like if people are receiving money, um, they're just going to quit their job, they're not going to want to work anymore. Um, and we have not seen that at all um, in any of those studies that we have done. Um, and this is including most of these happening right like during a pandemic where people are, are losing their jobs consistently. Um, so even in this last year, so this, this cohort went from um, 2021 to early 2022, which in some ways was past like, you know, the, the quote unquote worst parts of the pandemic. Um, but we still saw 51% of moms during that year lose their job because of the pandemic, uh, mostly because their, their childcare resources or their schools might have shut down um, and they had to take time off, uh, which they didn't have any sick leave in their positions and so lost their job that way. Um, or if, if they contracted COVID, um, we also had moms who were fired from their jobs because of that. Um, however, at the end of the program, we still saw kind of the same number of people employed at the beginning and the end, um, showing that, you know, it's not going to just make everyone quit their job at the end uh, or by receiving the cash. Um, and what we saw even more so was, was mothers who were working multiple jobs being able to cut down to be able to work reasonable hours and find more flexible employment. Um, so most of our families uh, in, in Mississippi, our minimum wage is still the federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five an hour. So even if you're working forty hours a week um, full time throughout the year, you're really only making you know between eleven and twelve thousand dollars a year, um, which is obviously not enough to support a family on. Uh, so most moms were working you know two to three jobs. Uh, just to make ends meet and um, really trying to work kind of crazy hours in order to support their kids um, and be able to do what they needed to. Uh, but with this program, again, with having that baseline of support, we saw a lot of moms be able to go down from working two to three jobs to just working one job um, or even being able to take some time off to really be able to find a position that made sense for them, whether that was um, something like working from home um, or just something with more reasonable or flexible hours so that they could care for their families um, and get out of positions that, that made them feel unsafe. Um, and, and that really plays into kind of the biggest thing that we see and that the moms talk about was just reporting um, having happier children and being able to spend more quality time with them. Um, so not only were they able to purchase basic things like school supplies and clothes, um, or even being able to pay for things like um, a tuba so that a kid could be in the marching band or being able to take their kids on vacation to the beach for the first time. Um, being able to just like cut back on those employment hours really allowed parents to spend more time with their kids, um, to be able to prioritize their kids in a way that they wanted to. Um, and, and just the decreased stress on the parents also showed up a lot in the way that the kids were reacting um, and being able to, to live their lives. Um, so these are just some quotes from some of the moms kind of exemplifying some of these things that we talked about that came out in the study. Um, so people feeling more confident, being able to voice opinions, spending more time with kids instead of working, um, and just being able to, again, really feel like they're able to push themselves towards doing better and not being as afraid to step out um, on a limb or maybe go back to school or look for a different job, um, because not everything is tied up in that one moment of just trying to survive. 
Um, so as we continue to think what is next, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about this in the questions too, um, we know we've been uh, a national leader really in the guaranteed income space for a while, and we really hope to continue to use that expertise in different ways, um, both by continuing to connect with other partners um, and then also continuing to connect, especially with Ideas 42, as we think about um, how to do some of this work around narrative change and storytelling and really thinking about how do we change people's mindsets about cash. Um, I think in some ways the pandemic was really helpful in that and in, in helping us see like, okay, when we give people cash, um, you know, they spend it on their basic needs, they support their families, they take care of what they need to take care of. Um, and we really can trust families to do that. But I think as we continue to see with um, the fight about the child tax credit and other pieces, we still hold on to these really, really negative narratives, um, particularly surrounding um, for Black women and what they're going to do with money if they are given that. Um, and despite the research we've done that repeats that, and I think the research so many other people have done that repeats that, those messages are really nailed into our brains. Um, and so we hope to continue to find different ways to push beyond just having programs and, and really move towards policy change, because at the end of the day, um, unless we can change policy, uh, programs like ours will just continue to serve a small, a small number of folks instead of the large scale that it could reach. Um, so that is my presentation on ours, and I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lisa Gilbert and I am from the city of Alexandria. I'm responsible for the, um, the implementation and the operation of state and federal benefits programs in our city, as well as local programs and services to address um, crisis related to housing and food and workforce development. Um, so I, uh, with that, I'd say thank you to Nicole and Ideas42 for the invitation to be a part of this panel and the opportunity to share the City of Alexandria's guaranteed income work. Um, we're excited about the project and we know that it will have a positive impact on our community. I've been asked particularly to discuss the actions and steps that we've taken to launch the guaranteed income from the perspective of a local government utilizing um, American Rescue Fund dollars. Um, I, I first, I need to disclaim that we have just completed the application process and is now in the process of identifying program participants. Um, and before I go to the next slide, I just wanna talk a little bit about the name. Um, the, the program is Arise. It's uh, Alexandria's Recurring Income for Success and Equity. And uh, this name, um, the name was informed through an engagement process. And um, so the engagement process is kind of how we've done a lot of the work um, for to build and design the, the project. Um, the official name is like our North Star. Um, it really is about the implementation and we want it to invoke uh, positive connotations. We want it to be easy to say, it's inspiring and communicates trust and trusting in people to make decisions for themselves, inspiring the people who um, to achieve their full potentials and also convey the, um, the dignity and inclusivity that we want to, um, to be a part of this program. Next slide. You may ask like why a guaranteed income in Alexandria because you know Alexandria is a, it's it's a small city um, in the DC metropolitan area. Um, we have 160 people. The income levels here are pretty high. It it, um, it in Alexandria uh, the area medium income in 20, uh, 2021 was 129,000, and this year it's 140 um, 142,000. So. Um, it really just, when you, just from those numbers, you think of it as a very um, rich and um, well-to-do community. However, um, our poverty levels has, uh, pre-COVID has always hovered around eight or 9%. And even today, it's around 10.4%. A little over 30,000 residents receive Medicaid and about 60% of our students receive free and reduced lunch. Um, also, um, poverty levels among our uh, BIPOC population um, is a combined 63%. So we saw the guaranteed income as an opportunity, um, the goals of that really aligns with the principles of moving um, from poverty to economic mobility, economic success, um, power and autonomy, 
and feeling valued in the community. So guaranteed income gives the ability to pay bills to, to um, address an unexpected expense and have choice and experience a sense of hope and belonging. And so um, this was an opportunity for Alexandria to act very boldly uh, to help our residents move to economic stability. Um, and we, we, we hope that the learnings of, of how to direct cash, we hope to learn how direct cash payments can change lives and our community, as well as use the lessons learned to transform our existing safety net programs. Um, so this is an investment for all Alexandrians, and it aligns very much with our commitment for equity, um, racial and social equity. Next slide. So we start this process by building um, community and political will. Um, and this was really informed by the work that we did with the CARES Act dollars. Um, and so what we learned from that uh, really kind of identifies sort of the guaranteed income as the next step. Um, we implemented a grocery gift card program. And through that experience, we learned that it was important for our residents to have choice and dignity in the process of, of receiving help. Um, so we, um, City of Alexandria received $60 million to the American Rescue Act um, plan, the American Rescue Plan Act to address negative economic um, impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The city manager and city council asked staff, the uh, city staff to put forward projects to address the gaps and needs in our community. So the staff at DCHS, we saw it as a real opportunity to really take a bold step again to, um, to move forward with economic mobility. Um, recognizing that we could not do this work in silo, we immediately mobilized our partnerships. We identified partners for, the planning, for our planning team, and that included uh, the community philanthropic foundations, such like Act for Alexandria and the Brumars um, Family Foundations. They worked alongside us in um, and, and in some cases ahead of us in educating and advocating with city council members and the community and brought resources to the table for expertise um, in the planning and design of the pilot. Um, very, and also uh, one of our partners very early on in our process, we really wanted to capitalize on our relationship with the state, the special, particularly the state social service office to build support um, for the current project as well as in the future. Um, so we scheduled a meeting very early on and requested a commitment for benefits waivers um, and building off of their uh, engagement with another local jurisdiction uh, with benefits waivers, we um, secured their um, commitment to, um, to support us and to give um, provide benefits waivers. We also had a number of thought partners at the table with, uh, with the research, including re uh, reaching out to programs like Magnolia Trust, um, who just presented, and other um, guaranteed income programs around the country. We also connected with the United Way of, of New Jersey, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, uh, the Mayor for our Guaranteed Income, um, IDS42, um, who brought the expertise to the table in terms of language and engaging um, potential partners. Um, and early on, our mayor signed on with the um, Mayor Spread Guaranteed Income as a supporter of the Guaranteed Income. So that really gave us momentum to be able to, to move to the next um, level. Um, in Alexandria, community engagement and input is, is embraced. And um, so from the onset, City Council required that we engage the community um, on the investment of our dollars. So all programs, all proposals that the, the staff put forward were um, vetted by the community. Um, and once we got approval for the guaranteed income, we had additional sessions um, for the general public as well as the community partners um, to providing more details on you know, what we were thinking in terms of developing uh, the, the pilot. Um, we had the opportunities to survey and hold service um, focus groups with potential participants. And these focus groups and, and, uh, and surveys were facilitated by our community partners who had uh, trusting relationships with, um, with the potential participants. So we were really um, dependent on um, from the very beginning up until now, um, even to, with our community partners in terms of carrying the message and supporting our efforts. Um, 
Okay, one of the questions we get is with the community inputs, did we get pushback? We did get some, some questions, some um, questions about why a guaranteed income, why use these funds in this way? Why not focus on job development and placement and you know, why budget to have an evaluation component um, and why not serve more people? And so we were able to make adjustments to our program based on, um, uh, on, on that community input and it's proud to be able to join other um, community guaranteed, uh, guaranteed income communities um, in, in, in being able to implement a project like this. Next slide. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of our guaranteed income um, project. Um, and uh, first uh, we were appropriated $3 million of um, opera dollars. Um, and I put the timeline here on the slide for you to just get an idea of like from the signing of the of the law by President Biden to when we um, the city council um, approved the funding. And so you can imagine between the timeline, the number of um, that staff had to be ready to be able to be a part of those input sessions and to to really talk about um, the pilot. And um, we we just really we did a lot of uh, research. And I had some initial information um, to share, but really not the full design. And um, we had hope from that when we started there that we would be able to implement the program within six months. But many things prevented that from happening. Um, so we designed the project in, in fidelity with a guaranteed income model derived from the Stockton, um, the work in, in Stockton, California. Um, it's the cash payment for $500 for 170 households. We originally started with 150, but again, community input. Um, we, we were able to uh, make some adjustments to the budget and increase the number of households we would serve. And we are serving households at or below the income, 50% um, of the area median income, no restrictions um, on how those dollars are spent. Uh, the pilot includes a uh, robust uh, research and evaluation component. And the goal is to gather information from the 170 participants and the 210 households um, drawn from the same application pool to be the comparative control group. Uh, the research design would allow us to understand cause that, um, to understand sort of how the um, cash transfer will impact the lives of um, the, recipient, the participants in the program. We anticipate that it will increase um, stability, uh, increase uh, its ability to make, uh, to meet their daily needs, pay rent, um, and uh, really take uh, take chances in terms of en um, enrolling and exploring some of the, the goals that they have and improvement in well-being and um, mental and emotional well-being. Next slide. We have a range, uh, we've learned a lot um, at this stage and we're not at in the implementation, we're just at the, the application stage really. Um, so one of the major lessons we've learned is, is how it, it really is in methodical and intentional um, in terms of developing um, and launching this type of projects for systems change. Um, we've changed and we've moved our deadlines for implementation um, several times because we wanted to develop and execute a defensible project. We wanted to make sure that we took, we build a, the infrastructure um, for now um, for this project, but also in the future. Uh, we learned about communicate, communicate, even when you don't have a lot of changes and information, you can still communicate. Um, we had the input sessions, um, the learnings from the input sessions, the pilots and the expertise at the table with us. And so we, um, with a team of, with our community partners and the local, the local communication um, staff and expertise underwritten by our partners, we were able to develop a communication strategic plan. And it, the goal with that plan is to build participation and support for the project. Uh, and it is very true in terms of, you know, the wheels of government moves very slowly even more so when there's ambiguity about the use of federal dollars. Um, and we will also had to deal with um, change in state and local leadership and key personnel um, as we were um, designing this. So again, 
um, more delays, um, but also opportunities to learn um, for the implementation and for the future. Our pursuit of benefits um, protections very early on, um, at some point midway through, did not yield the results that we um, initially hoped for, um, because um, while the cash transfer programs were permissible um, with the upper funds, the expenditures um, related to cash transfer, the policies to ensure the success and hold participants harmless were not adjusted or modified with the intent um, of the cash transfer program. So that has created some roadblocks for us, um, but we have thought about addressing the, uh, that in terms of developing a hold harmless fund. And with the hold harmless fund, um, we want to ensure that existing safety net benefits that will be impacted, that we're able to, um, to support the households that have, um, but if that would have a loss um, due to that. And so we really understand because of the work that we're doing with our benefits program, we also understand that with the end of the public health emergency, that there will be some loss in, in terms of food security and healthcare resources. And, and so that, um, that I think that really underscored and kind of motivate us to um, continue to look into Hold Harmless Fund. And we hope to be able to, to build a, um, to, to raise funds to, um, for that particular um, fund. What's next for us, um, you may ask. What's next for us is that, you know, um, we need to fully implement the pilot um, and um, we need to earnestly and intentionally create the space to lift up the voices and experiences of, of our, our neighbors living with um, low income. Uh, we need to engage in the narrative change um, in our community um, and really that our, our neighbors um, are working and they're making the best decisions they can with the resources they have. Um, and they just don't have enough to meet, to meet basic needs. Uh, we also recognize that this experience, um, this project is a learning lab from the beginning to the end. We already have lessons learned. Um, and as we go along to be able to, um, where we can is inform policies and leadership at the state and local levels um, about what we're seeing and what we're, um, from this, uh, from the rich data um, that we're gathering and experiences. In, in developing and in executing this project. Um, on, on a macro sense, we really, um, we really anticipate that we will have information that inform how we engage and support um, people economically challenged with, um, in our existing benefits and safety net programs. So our work is also to make sure that the, the, the um, participants in this pilot um, at the end of the pilot is better off and that we have a sound and scalable transition plan for our um, participants. We, we also want to be able to show how to reduce the administrative burden and costs to getting and receiving help. So um, overall, we see this as an opportunity for Alexandria to, um, to pay that this opportunity paves the way for our city to continue to be progressive, responsive, and bold in addressing the income disparities and the inequities that exist in our community. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Finks. I'm a senior director with the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, and it's really an honor to be on this panel and very grateful uh, to Ideas42 for um, hosting today. So um, we are trying to build off of all the great work uh, happening around the country in um, Washington State and really try to scale uh, a basic income at the state level. And we were directed by the legislature in 2021 to do a basic income feasibility study for the state. And so today I'm gonna share some of those findings and, and uh, where things are at in Washington. Um, so next slide, please. So this work is not happening in a vacuum. Um, 
I, I want to briefly just point you to uh, the 10 year plan to dismantle poverty in Washington state, which uh, this effort started in 2018. Governor Inslee created a poverty reduction work group in Washington. That work group was um, directed by a steering committee of people with lived expertise in poverty and inequality. Uh, they were really the, the guiding force behind the development of the 10-year plan. And these are the eight strategies um, that were incorporated into the plan with 60 specific recommendations. Um, two of those recommendations were uh, focused on direct cash and actually establishing a guaranteed income pilot uh, in Washington state. So the legislative directive to us was uh, an outgrowth of the incredible work that was done um, by the Poverty Reduction Workgroup. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, we can really easily show what the problem is with data. Um, there are tons of gaps and cliffs in our public assistance programs. Um, you know, the, we could spend a lot of time on this slide, but the bottom line is if you use um, a level of self-sufficiency, which we use the self-sufficiency standard at the University of Washington, um, which is a cost of living measure. Like what does it actually take to, to make ends meet? And even under the most rosiest scenario where people are getting most of the benefits that they're eligible for, uh, even under that rosy scenario, there's still an enormous gap between what it actually takes to make ends meet and what somebody might receive through public assistance. So um, basic income, the whole, the proliferation of pilots happening around the country is not happening in a vacuum. It is very much a reflection that while our public assistance programs do a lot of good, they're still, um, they fall short of actually um, moving people to a place um, of what I think Lisa called uh, economic success, um, having power and autonomy over your life and that feeling of belonging. Next slide, please. I think it's really important though um, to uh, hear what the people who are served by our programs, how they define the problem. So what our steering committee members said to us is, you know, Participating in your programs is like a game of shoots and ladders. As soon as I take a breath and just have this second um, to sit on the floor and play with my kids, the, the rug gets pulled out from underneath me. Um, they talked about, you know, what's a secret handshake? Like, I don't even know how to get the services that I need. Um, the programs don't communicate with one another. It's absolutely exhausting. The burden of figuring out how to navigate the system is on us, and it's like a full-time job. And one of our participants um, on our steering committee uh, said, you know, people ask me, what does healthy look like being to you? And she said, being healthy basically looks like being rich. So as we gathered these stories and really heard from our steering committee, you know, what it's like, I mean, it was a very sobering moment in our, um, in all of health and human services in Washington. And we very much took this um, into consideration when we crafted this study. Next slide, please. So we developed a project team and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I do think it's really important. And I think um, both uh, Lisa and Sarah mentioned this. We really felt that uh, in everything that we do, we need to be incorporating people who stand to benefit the most from um, the policies and programs or the funding changes that you are looking to make. So we developed an incredibly diverse project team that really guided the development of the feasibility study. Next slide, please. And this is what they said a basic income should do in Washington state. It should honor the dignity of human beings by ensuring their foundational needs are met and pathways to self-determination are abundant. It should end poverty by establishing a stronger economic floor with no cracks to fall through. It should contribute to racial equity and economic justice through a targeted universal approach. It should provide flexible resources that fill in the gaps of existing public assistance programs. It should value the act of caregiving and the role of caregivers who are often unpaid for their contributions to families and communities. And it should ease the burden of accessing resources by eliminating the oppressive conditions and requirements that we find in our current programs. Next slide, please. And while we looked at different iterations, and as you probably many are aware that there's 
um, nearly 100 pilots happening in the country right now. Um, and they're all a different kind of model. Um, so we had a lot, a lot to really learn from and build from. And what we uh, decided at the state level in terms of feasibility is that while universal basic income is definitely something um, you know, to explore further. At the state level, it's really not possible to do that without federal changes. So a universal model in its pure form, which to our knowledge has never really been implemented, um, was not feasible. But a targeted basic income very much is. And we looked to Magnolia Mothers Trust and the Stockton experiment, as well as Babies First Years and many different pilots to really think about what this should look like at the state level. Next slide, please. And so this is the model that is um, being considered right now. Um, you know, again, uh, develop and administer a targeted model, a guaranteed income for Washington State. We um, recommended establishing the Evergreen Trust. We are the Evergreen State, so that is a direct reference to um, how we identify. And it should be a collaboration, uh, equal collaboration among state, tribal, and community partners. Um, developing the study is one thing, implementing it in a way that's actually going to achieve the just and equitable outcomes we would like to see needs to be an equal partnership among public and private actors. And our community partners and tribal partners are especially um, important to that effort. We're recommending a two year pilot focused on two groups. Um, People experiencing poverty, which is defined as below 100% of the federal poverty level, um, with no or low employment, um, plus a control group. And then a second group, low income with employment, um, 100 to 200% of the federal poverty level. And the reason for that is that these are two um, groups that are both experiencing economic hardship, but often have very different circumstances. People experiencing deep, deep poverty have a different set of um, conditions that they're off the more compounding conditions, as opposed to people who might be floating around the cliff effect. And we think basic income is operating differently for both of them. We also recommended targeting to one of the following priority populations that we see as um, that are experiencing a very destabilizing transition or circumstance. And that includes pregnancy, people experiencing homelessness, an immigrant or refugee, uh, exit from the foster care, juvenile, or criminal justice system, um, somebody experiencing a behavioral health issue, a work-limiting disability, or escaping an abusive or violent um, situation. And um, we recommended attaching basic income to uh, as a percentage of fair market rent, and we gave the legislature multiple options to consider. So the reason for fair market rent is um, threefold. Basically, fair market rent, um, it is adjusted by region, so it automatically uh, is adjusted to cost of living. Um, we know that the lack of affordable housing is really driving the homelessness crisis in Washington state and nationally, and it also adjusts from year to year um, for both regional changes um, in cost of living and inflation. So, uh, you know, for those three reasons, we felt like making basic income a percentage of that was important. We provided estimates for how much this would cost based upon 75 percent, 100 and 120 percent of fair market rent. We provided estimates for sample sizes um, of 5,000, 7,500 and 10,000 um, and really conducting a statewide pilot in what we call our managed care regions. There are already established healthcare regions in our state. Um, and also uh, made specific recommendations about how agencies should move to protect federal and state benefits to the greatest extent possible um, as they can do by law. So just to give you a sense of what that looks like, the range of guaranteed income at a minimum in the least expensive county in Washington um, at, is $587 at the 75% level and uh, up to in our most expensive county, King County, at that 120% level, $2,453. So um, we submitted the study in June. 
Uh, there is a representative in our state who is working with an advocacy coalition that has formed to take the study. They're using the study to uh, develop a bill, and we expect that that bill is going to be dropped this session, and we will continue to socialize the idea. Um, but extremely grateful to all the work that has happened around the country to really um, let us take all that local knowledge and try to scale um, to the extent we're trying to scale. And the ultimate goal is really to um, establish an eventual program in Washington. So thank you so much. Back to you, Nicole. Thanks so much, Lori. And uh, we're going to move now into our Q&A. We have just a couple of minutes left for questions. I can see there are already a lot, which is really exciting. And I actually want to start with one that came in before the event. Um, because this is a policy event and this is a policy oriented question, I thought this would be a nice one to kick off with. So this question was, how can we help bring this work forward to policymakers so that we can scale basic income in a way that moves beyond pilots to sustainable programs at the city or state level? So I would love both of you to speak to this question. And I'll just start by saying that from a behavioral perspective, we know that giving people information is really often not enough. So we have cognitive biases, we have these harmful narratives that are deeply entrenched in our identity and our stories. We really need to understand these barriers at the roots and get them there. So this often looks like things like telling relatable stories. Uh, Sarah, you talked about storytelling. Uh, it looks like calling out instances of biases, things like fundamental attribution error, which is when we as humans tend to attribute other people's actions to their character or their personality, but give ourselves uh, much more breath. We attribute our behavior to external or situational factors outside of our control. And Ideas for Two is taking a two-part approach to this. So we're working with communities to shift narratives about people living in poverty among those communities, because we actually find that some of the folks who hold these harmful narratives are the very people about whom the narratives are. And we're also thinking about how do we do some research and some diagnosis around what could shift the minds of policymakers and politicians, right? So what are the things that communities could do to advocate and what are the things that we can do? So I'd love to, to turn this over to maybe to Sarah, we could start with you um, to think about this question about scale. And if you've thought about it for Magnolia Mothers Trust, you know, what does the five or 10 year ideal plan look like? And then Lori would love to you, uh, hear from you as well. Yeah, thanks Nicole. Um, so, I mean, this is something that we talk about all the time. I think if, if Aisha, uh, Nandora, who's our CEO, was on here, she would always say, um, in 10 years, we hope that we're retired, right? Like, we shouldn't be doing this anymore, <laughs> um, because that would that would be a failure on our end, because we weren't able to move this towards something more sustainable than, than a small little program. Um, and so, yeah, I think the biggest piece that we continue to think about and work on when it comes to this is, is really that narrative piece, um, which is a big reason why we're partnering with Ideas42 to talk about that and, and think about what that can look like in Jackson and um, particularly thinking about um, are there other areas and arenas where we can think about cash to kind of like normalize cash and giving folks cash as opposed to um, just pushing for like a state program or a city program um, or even... I think ultimately like what we want to see is a federal program, but um, we know that there's like limits to that. And especially in Mississippi, like it's, we have to get creative um, to be able to think about this. So, you know, some of the questions that we're exploring in that is like, what would it look like if um, a school system was, was giving families money, right? What would it look like if a criminal justice system was thinking about giving people money instead of, um, you know, punishing people, or um, we've been doing some work with with CPS and um, Child Protective Services, and what does it look like if we respond to neglect with cash as opposed to punishment, right? Um, and so I think we're trying to explore kind of some of those areas and say, like, who, who are the people we can work with here who can show the way that this works um, within a government agency, within a space uh, that can hopefully really change people's minds um, and, and be able to like work into thinking about that narrative in new ways. Because I, I think at the end of the day, until that changes, um, right, until like the way media changes and, and is telling stories differently, the way that that our policymakers are thinking about people differently, the way that kind of our collective knowledge is doing that, um, we won't see a lot of policy change until then. Thanks, Sarah. Lori, what would you add to that? 
Yeah, I agree with everything that Sarah said. And I also think um, you probably, everyone saw that we all centered people with lived expertise in the work that we've done. And the more that we can do that and um, work in collaboration and as colleagues with the people that we're serving um, and bring them into the spaces where these conversations are happening, what you see happen is once you have that immediate connection with somebody and they're explaining their story, um, it's really hard to judge them. Um, it really changes the way that the work happens. We've been increasingly doing it in Washington. Um, and, uh, you know, making those relation relational changes um, and having this be a wider discussion and the, expanding that cir circle of human concern is the only way that I, I think that we're gonna be able to change the narrative and the policy change. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both. I want to quickly address maybe one or two questions and then we'll we'll close with one final question. So I saw a couple of questions about sort of the ideal level of support, you know, what's the right number to give to folks. Um, I also saw some questions about, um, how, you know, do we compare to control groups or what's sort of the evidence behind this? And I do want to flag that there was a meta-analysis that was completed recently in 2021, um, which included a review of I think 60 or so uh, RC, or not all of them are RCTs, but pilot programs some of which were RCTs, and they did find that basic income or a guaranteed income floor does result in things like a lower spending on social care or health care. So we do see that uh, that benefit. I'm happy to share that after the event. Um, but I want to pose this question of, you know, I know both of you probably thought a lot about what is the right number, you know, and what I have seen is something between the 500 and the $1,000 a month range, sometimes higher as well, but most of the basic income programs that pop up are in that range. And now with inflation, I think we're all thinking, does it need to be even higher? But how did you go about thinking about that? And what are the trade-offs that you considered? And is there a magic number that you would suggest uh, is the one that others who are thinking about scaling this kind of program should, should apply? Can we start with Lori maybe this time? Yeah, we've thought about this a lot, and and you know it it is an unanswered question because the proliferation of research is is re is relatively recent. I mean, it goes back to the 70s, right? But most of the work has been happening in the last like five years. So, I um, you know, you saw how we chose to deal with it with fair market rent being you know what we pegged basic income to. I think it's a really great way to do it because um, we know from the research that anywhere actually from $333 a month has an effect on baby brain development um, and anywhere up to $1,500 right, has a, a, a sizable impact on stability, belonging, feelings of dignity. Um, and that, you know, all of that um, reverberates into communities, right? So, um, you know, I don't know if there's ever going to be like one magic number. Um, the reason that we like fair market rent is because it is something that is an issue nationwide. It is felt in every single community. Housing is unaffordable nearly everywhere. Um, and because of the, the way that it adjusts for cost of living um, and size of apartment, et cetera, um, that is how we chose to um, use it. So, yeah. Yeah, Sarah. I mean, very yeah. thorough approach. Yeah, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is such a great question. You know, and I think part of this is really dependent on on community and where you are, um, which is a big reason why like people will ask us all the time, like, can we have a blueprint of your program or whatever? And we're always like, no, you need to talk to the people in your community, right? Because like what a thousand dollars does in Jackson is like so different than what a thousand dollars does in Seattle. Like those are completely different contexts. Um but, you know, when we picked our number, we, again, we did this really in design with our families and kind of talked about like what they thought they would need and what that might look like. Um, but particularly when we started, since there weren't any other programs, we, we were really guessing a lot too when it came to like social safety net benefits and what that was going to look like because there wasn't a model out there at that point. Um, and part of the reason why our number is on the higher end of a lot of these programs is because we knew there was no way we were going to get like waivers to be able to take this away from income for folks just because over in Mississippi and this is the context that we have. And so what we end up seeing um, in terms of, of a hit when it comes to social safety net benefits is usually between three to four hundred dollars for folks. So they're usually making around still a net income of around seven hundred. Um, but what most of our families are receiving is SNAP and then obviously um, 
Section 8 housing because that's the population we serve. And so um, we see their rent go up a little bit, their shop go down a little bit. Um, and that's kind of where they end up coming out, um, which has seemed to be a good number. Uh, as we've continued to work through the program uh, every year, we're continuing to conduct like focus groups and talks with families who have been a part of it and say like, is this still a good number? Does this still make sense? And what we've continued to hear is that like, yes, this is a number that we need right now. And so um, as long as our families keep telling us that, we're going to kind of stick with that. Um, but yeah, but I think again, it all goes back to to working with your community, figuring out what's possible. Um, and especially if, if, you know, you are a government agency being able to start this, um, thinking about some of the ways that you can do um, waivers or workarounds or whatever that looks like in terms of taxes is, is huge. Um, and I think it'd be a huge benefit to families. Yeah, we could have a whole event just on uh, benefits clips yeah. and things like yeah. a harmless fund. Um, and I wish we had another hour to continue through all the questions that have come through, but I want to pass it back to Kelly to close this out. And thank you both so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Kelly, back over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks to all of you and all our wonderful speakers and to everyone who attended today. And we do know, as Nicole said, we have a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer. So please be on the lookout for an email with a link to the webinar recording and additional resources. We will try to address unanswered questions there. Also, I just wanted to let everybody know Lisa had to drop off early, but we will also share the questions with her and hopefully, um, again, send out some materials with information there. Also, uh, we are in the process of planning our events for next year, so expect to see an upcoming event that focuses on um, policies to increase emergency savings for people with low incomes. And we are also, of course, thinking about new topics, so please email us if you have any ideas about what else you would like to see from us. And finally, um, I just wanted to thank, again, all of you for coming and for Wells Fargo for making this event series possible. Thank you all.